waiting to see if this thing will uh, load up. All right, we'll get started in just one more minute. Yeah. Yeah, wow, we're at like 39. Okay, good. We have the right one up now. Okay. We have 40. We do. Let's do it. Okay. Well, so we're going to get started. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jay Littman, partner with Fielding International in the Rhode Island uh, office. We have uh, four offices across the United States um, in College Park, Maryland, in uh, at right outside of Detroit, Michigan, and right in Minneapolis, which is our home office. Um, we do work, each office does work all over the world and all over the United States, focused mm -hmm. on its general area, but we have work across the country and across the globe. Uh, and Jill Akers will introduce herself. She's our chief educator. Um, for the firm live, living out in Colorado. Did you just introduce me? I was gonna let you say something <laughs> about yourself. I know, it was funny. I'm Jill, it's nice to meet everyone. Um, I am not the architect in the group. I'm an educator for Fielding International. And um, when we start a project from um, anywhere from a small renovation to a full ground up, we always have an educator working with the architects. So I'm fortunate to work in all of our Fielding International offices and um, work on projects all over the world alongside Jay and other architects really looking at um, the confluence of pedagogical practices and the physical affordances needed for innovative education. So um, as an educator, I feel very fortunate enough to get to um, work with teachers and school leaders um, around the world. And we yeah. Great. And this session is called How to Reopen Schools So All Learners Thrive. Uh, and, and the one thing to build on what Jill just said is we don't consider ourselves an architecture firm. We consider ourselves an education design firm because um, we also have planners and interior designers and everybody has extensive experience with education, schools and libraries, mostly schools. And we look at how to make lives better for students and for teachers. Um, and with that context, of course, when the pandemic hit, uh, all offices shut, our office remained open and fully staffed because because of the way we're structured and because we've been working virtually across the world for since I think 2008 is when uh, WebEx first started. Um, we're, we just, one day we were open and next day we gave people their computers to take home and they continued working and some worked remotely and all of our work overseas continued and all of our work in the United States continued. So when this came out, uh, the CDC um, guidelines, we were horrified because the picture on the left is essentially what they were looking to have us do. We line everybody up in straight little rows and then put plastic barriers in between them. Um, and that's pretty scary. And the, the image on the right, which is a school in the United States, um, we believed in, uh, you know, that it didn't seem like that was the safe way to do things. And uh, it was better to have uneven groupings of students across uh, something we call a learning community, which we'll discuss a little bit in a minute. And so, you know, what happened was that there was a um, controversy between the WHO and the CDC. The WHO was saying one meter and the CDC was saying six feet. And that first week we got this, we did some calculating among all the different schools we have in our database and said, well, gosh, if you follow that, you can't fit the students in the schools. Most schools are shrink wrapped around a program and they don't give you any funding to build anything more than exactly what you need. There's no such thing as wiggle room in schools in the United States. So that meant you could fit 40% of your students in most schools. And we knew there was a big problem coming. And of course, 
what the CDC um, uh, protocols resulted in was this. You want to ask the first question? Sure. So um, how many of you either work in or work with schools um, that have done this in their classrooms? And you can just say, like, in other words, did your, did your schools initially start looking like this? And you can say yes or no. Um, we're just looking to get a response on, on the chat line um, to get a, a sense of what your experiences were when this first uh, began. So yes, yes, no, not sure, haven't seen them yet. Good, yes and no. Lower left working with, oh gosh, really? Yep. So lots of yeses and nos in this case. Yeah, well, there's a lot of pushback because most teachers know this is not good. We, we've spent our careers moving away from the lined up tables and chairs as the research has said, that's not good. Um, we're, looking, we're looking for multiple sustainability. We're looking for healthy environments that just don't stop at hygiene. In this case, you know, minimizing the you know, infection rate of COVID but keeping students with this sort of a balance of social emotional uh, environments. Right, um, so we have some that are still almost all uh, remote in Boston, some that are completely open, some with spacing um, in the classrooms and no, none like that. Yes, definitely working with Massachusetts schools. Um, not sure, haven't seen them yet. Yes, without the plexiglass. Um, so. Absolutely. It's a huge variation that we have found because the CDC's guidelines um, were not very explicit. We started our work much earlier in the summer. It was June when we started putting um, together this work. And so this was all still really up in the air. Um, we were doing, we had three foot distancing and six foot distancing and trying to help our schools really understand what would be the best way to keep our students safe upon return. And so um, we have a lot of schools who are setting up their rooms with plexiglass dividers, um, who are yes doing the six foot spacing and um, not the plexiglass in one room. And then when you go to the next room, there's plexiglass and six foot spacing. So we have a lot of variation, even in our own classroom buildings and buildings within districts, we have a huge variation. We have some kindergarten classes that um, are sitting on the floor with a three foot spacing, and then some kindergarten students that are in desks designed for um, students much larger than them and at a six foot spacing. So- um, Very bad social emotional environment. And so there's an article that I wrote for, um, uh, the Green Schools Catalyst Quarterly, and we started doing research, and this was in June, and we just we actually met with Chris Gill, who is uh, one of the key people in the public health school at uh, BU. So uh, he's head of the infect. He's a <laughs> epidemiologist and head of the infectious disease department in Boston University. Yeah, and he had been on NPR, and we listened to him, and the research I was getting from him from Dr. Christakis out in Seattle, who was doing psychological studies of students in these kind of environments, and Dr. Marr that Chris turned us on to, who all the way back in the beginning of July put a paper in environmental science uh, with the first one to say, it's not droplets. The screens don't do anything. It's an aerosol. It's, it's contracted very similarly to tuberculosis, which we have a lot of history with and know about. And so, as it turned out, ironically, the screens will actually help students get infected faster because when you sneeze, it's not droplets that stick to the screen. It's an aerosol that rises in the air. Most schools in the United States do not have a proper ventilation system. So what happens is that it rises in the air, distributes through the space, and then it drifts back down on everybody. Like, and those barriers act like ice cube trays. So they just, you're, it, you want air to move around the students. You don't want to impede the air. So they were going apoplectic because they said, this is worse. 
And uh, they said, all you need to do is wear a mask and move the students away from each other into uneven groupings, just like we were saying. So we started to really build our research base based on, on what they were telling us. Um, and so, Jill, we had other questions, right? Like, as, as, like, like as a good or bad, or how did your students react? If, if you are a teacher and you were in school, what kind of reaction did you get when your students came back into school if you had these kinds of setups? You know, the alignments, no more blended learning, just pretend it's 1952. Just happy to be in school in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all of us. Ouch. <laughs> no. Only one person has a reaction from their students. Well, I think it depends too on who, um, how many teachers we have in our virtual space today. If the majority are architects and planners, it might be challenging. Um, True. Tired of virtual, glad to be in. Yes, we're all. It's. I tell you, one of the things that the um, that Dr. Christakis' uh, uh, research had said is that, and this is something I think boys for all of us who design schools, who how many of you are architects out there, and planners, is that you need to be taught in person. There's a social connection that uh, students need for growth, and sitting at home does not do it. I mean, it's hard enough if you're five or six years old. You know, it might be fun and novel, but uh, when you are, you know, um, anywhere from fifth grade on, it's really difficult. Fourth grade too, uh, because you want to be with your friends, and and you know, it's it's a shared life experience, which stops. And that's not good. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit here because we want to talk about how to adapt the kind of schools we most often have, and in this case, since we're talking about you know, MH, uh, M -M -E -H -C, where we're basically talking about New England, and I've had a career in New England, I know what the schools look like, and, and we work hard to change them. Um, but you can design schools as we move forward, and this is to, to everyone who designed schools in this group today. Um, the schools that we design in the United States and overseas haven't had a lot of these problems because the venues are designed for uh, student directed learning um, and for bringing students out of the room and into spaces around the school. And this is a brand new high school in Tartarstan. It's part of the Russian Federation. It's the second large high school we've done out there. And um, these are typical spaces. And as you can see, there's a lot of opportunities um, to separate kids because that's how the venues work like this. Um, can, can, by the way, Jill, can you see my arrow? No, you I can't. cannot see your arrow. So there's no, I don't think there's any pointing tools with this. So the, the big, the big uh, bleachers or what we call a Kiva, we have in a lot of our schools. So they give students an opportunity for presentation, but you can see you, you can separate them and spread them apart. There's lots of spaces outside the classroom where students can do what I call grazing. So you can put students in pods of three, four, or five, and, and they can work. And you can design spaces, like this is a classroom, which is a typical learning studio, where all this glass in the front of the picture where the green is all open up into a large learning commons. And the, again, the idea is don't pack them in rooms diffuse them through spaces. And of course, the spaces have to be designed with a high level of ventilation because it's ventilation that reduces the viral particle count. Sticking them in rooms doesn't work. And don't forget, any, everyone that's designed a school knows in most cases, the return air uh, is going out in the hallway. So the hallway where you would put your students is like a giant virus sewer. And that's not good either. In these schools, there are no, there are no return corridors. They're all big spaces that are connected together into smaller learning communities. And that means even the libraries, like the, one, the picture on the right, uh, you can see, you can put naturally separated areas for kids. Or in the upper left, you can see we, we, we do a lot of booths and benches to again separate kids physically and small group rooms like the one at the bottom left. Um, still, Jill, do you want to add anything to any of this? 
Sure, I think that um, when we talk about reopening schools and the guiding principles that we really need to think about, um, regardless of whether you're in a hallway, traditional cells and bells model, or whether you're in a school that's designed for learn, learning community spaces, that the guiding principles are really holistic around supporting students. We know that learner-centered opportunities are build the kinds of skill sets that our students need. So we have to think about equity and access. We have to think about when we're looking at a holistic approach for reopening schools, that um, equity and access is built into the virtual environment as well as the built environment. And so how does that built environment, the school building, really support students when we have to possibly return to a model where only half of the students are in school or in the physical environment that's built for school 50% of the time. And then we still have to honor and engage innovation and creativity for students. So just because we've moved into a COVID era, we, we've moved past this 9-11 era into this COVID era around the world that, yes, safety is a priority, but now health and wellness has emerged now that we've experienced this. So we have to still embrace innovation and allow students to emerge with creativity within this environment. And that really comes through when we allow kids to learn in community. And so how do we utilize spaces even in a traditional building that continue to build community and keep this separation right now for where we are in spaces. So as we thought about writing this book and um, the emerging piece that's come out of the work with um, VS America is how do we actually align to these guiding principles that support the health and the wellness and the academic success of our students while going through this process. And so it's really become the pedagogical practices that we've been aiming for, for educators for the last 20 years, we're here. The iron curtain has been lifted. And so it's time for us to really think about what is the approach to reopening school because the physical affordances can really support you know, for lack of a better overused word, these 21st century skills that we've been working on to get into schools for the last 20 years. This is our chance to really reimagine those spaces. And so we've spent the time in this work working with VS to really think about these processes. Jay, do you want to tackle some of these or do you want me to? Yeah, keep well, I, 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 no, I can start with this. So, um, but we are going to talk about how you take a regular Cells and Bell school and respond, but we wanted to show you where we're coming from and what, what uh, you know, mindset we, we attack that problem with uh, because, you know, we sp we're spending our careers moving away from that and, and, and reinventing uh, and reconstructing uh, teaching and learning into a, into a new format based on, you know, what these kids need in the way of skills, the 21st century, and what teachers are telling us because mm -hmm. teachers are now the digital natives we talked about 10 and 15 years ago. Teachers are now in their mid thirties, young teachers that are, you know, somewhat experienced. They're all the age of my kids, you know? And so they're the ones that grew up with the internet. The, the, the old model school is now irrelevant to the teachers and the students. So we're really at a critical point. And most of those schools that were built on average, so we're, we did a master plan for Cranston, Rhode Island. The average age of schools in Cranston is 66 years old, average age means they have like 102 year old high schools and they have like on the average 50 to 65 year old elementary schools and they have 22 schools in that school district. So that's saying a lot and they're well beyond the age of repair. So, um, so with that idea in mind, the first thing we did is how do, we, how do we assist our clients in trying to figure out how to reopen school? And in Rhode Island, they had one dictum uh, that they announced in July, which is um, everyone's going to open fully at once in 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 uh, the last week of August. And we said that's that's crazy because no one knows how to work virtually. No one's got the training, and uh, we still didn't know a lot about the virus. And so there were three models that that we started off on, which 
as it turned out, everybody was doing the same research. And so they'd be, they kind of zeroed into these three models, which is the alternating hybrid return model, which most schools in the end did start with. And that's based on the idea, and this is a letter we wrote to the Rhode Island Department of Education, that you're going to be able to fit 40% of your students in a school, and we can't do that. So it means that, you know, either alternating days, students come in, or alternating weeks, I think, is what they wound up with, saying, which would make it a little more sane for students, that there's a 50% off and 50% on, uh, which made, because you needed less people in the school to meet the spacing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> if you have, and by the way, all these three, the full return strategy and the flexible return strategy, in the end, as we looked at all this, you know, we, we, we started to realize it's not either or. Everyone should start with the hybrid. That's like your training wheels to get everything get, get going, <clears throat> to practice <clears throat> with, the, um, uh, with the return, uh, with, with the virtual environment technology. Um, and then depending on the infection rate, you could slowly, you know, shift that. It's almost like having a steering wheel and brakes to say, okay, we're not getting any infections. Let's slowly shift up to return strategy, full return. And if something happened in a few districts, it did, then they would go back to alternating hybrid return. Some schools said, I'm staying completely home, 100% virtual, but you can't keep everybody home because you have kids that have food programs that they rely on. You have kids that have special needs that need to be in school with the teacher. Sometimes- we have workers. Yeah, so so you have a flexible return strategy. So we said this is a continuum, and you want to build on that at all? Sure. I, I think that one thing that um, is really important to us as educators when looking at a holistic pro approach is, you know, if community transition transmission increases, we can move to that flexible return strategy. We can move everybody there and then slowly move into a hybrid return strategy based on the decrease in transmission in the transmission rate, always working back towards a full return strategy, but that we're training teachers and we're really looking at the use of space to ensure that we can accommodate for these kinds of transitions over time? And then how are we reimagining spaces and the use of large spaces in our schools in all three strategies? So that way it's not students filing into a classroom, but how are we using conference spaces in a new way? How are we using um, the cathedimatorium as they call them in Rhode Island or um, the auditorium and the cafeteria a cafeteria, let's call it a cafetorium again, um, and the cafeteria. So how do we start to reimagine those spaces and how do we start to reimagine our libraries <clears throat> so that we're creating learning experiences and we can bring in more students when we have a decrease in transmission? How do we service um, students who need to take uh, school transportation? So what can those bus systems have um, how can they function with the amount of students we're bringing in and out? And so part of that also looks at the different kinds of timing that we've created throughout the school day. And some of our schools have also created a flexible timing strategy to go along with these processes. And so I think, again, looking at this, as Jay said, a continuum, not only from the building and the health perspective, but the ways in which our students are acquiring their content over the school year that keeps them safe. And um, we're, we're going to keep layering different things in here. So um, again, one of the things that we realized and we and we kept pushing is you have to abandon, you know, the uh, the little road strategy at schools. And uh, and at the same time, we also looked at individual behaviors that have to happen. A lot of the stuff the CDC and the WHO is saying made sense. It's just the, they don't have educators working for them. It's not an education group. And so their approach was pretty heavy handed or, or meat fisted in how school should be laying up because they don't know what the implications are. There is no education piece to them. So we looked at individual behaviors, which you all know, the mask wearing, the hand washing, social distancing, avoiding shared items, self screening, uh, a lot of contact tracing. Um, one of the things that we did find is people were being obsessive about hand washing 
and what Dr. Gill had told us way back in the summer, and I think other magazines and periodicals have since confirmed is that your chances of picking up COVID from a surface are minimal. It's all inhalation. Um, you'd have to wipe your hand on a desk, someone who's infected, sneezed on and stick your finger up your nose and probe for hours to get enough viral count in there. You can get 10,000 viral particles just by inhaling. That's how you're, that's all people are getting it. They're not getting it from touching surfaces. It's always a good practice to clean surfaces, but they were getting obsessive. The environmental factors were the key. Adequate ventilation, assigned mm -hmm. heating, which means also students working in pods, basic cleaning and disinfection, you know, having as many things outdoors as you can. And as everybody knows across the country, as winter is setting in in the northern tier states, that's getting more difficult. Um, and then adjustments in traffic and scheduling, something as simple as when the bell rings at the schools that have bells, you know, every student in the school is going to fit into a corridor and be like they were in, um, in, in Georgia, where they were, you know, shoulder to shoulder with half of them not wearing masks back in August, I think when that famous picture came out and that school shut down in a week. The simple common sense things are very important. Um, but again, we looked at, and we can show you examples of this, and I can start with one, and I guess, Joe, you can, we, we can flip back and forth, is, so we have a book that was released as a virtual book, and we have contacts at the end of this, so you can figure out where to go to get it. Uh, and um, it's been sponsored by VS America uh, because <clears throat> one of the things that we use a lot of that furniture among other furniture like Norva Nival and other, other brands, we're looking for furniture that's flexible that students can reconfigure um, and that we can set up in, in ways that are exact antithesis of what the CDC is talking about because again, it's ventilation and it, it is uneven groupings of students in the spaces and then working in pods. So for the hybrid model, you know, we, we looked at um, just showing how, how a typical classroom would be set up. I'm not sure why that Jill just disappeared on us. Um, let me go back to that picture. Not sure why that happened either. Um, we'll just pretend she's coming back in a second. I'm sure she is. And, um, and that's why, you know, quote out of our book, there you are. Sorry, um, I disappeared. Happened, no, that I happened had to a... earlier today, too, when we were testing this. That's why we said access and relationships are vital for all learning to thrive. Prioritizing learning goals to create equitable spaces for every student. Participating in those spaces through in-person virtual learning that are founded in an equitable and reliable resources. Because who has all the technology? And again, that's a management thing for schools. There are places, I have a niece who teaches... Um, um, down in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and when this hit, all schools stopped, and and you know they they don't have Wi-Fi in Norfolk, believe it or not, in 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 the, in the poorer neighborhoods, there's no way to reach anybody. She hasn't seen her third grade students. I think it just started now. So there's a lot of these places in the U.S. where this this isn't going to work. They have to be in school, all of them, and so they have to start looking for alternative ways because the CDC created a, a zero sum problem for everybody, which is they assume everyone is wired up and ready to go. And that's not the case. Uh, in this case, you wear a mask and you, you and you're assigned to pods and we'll show a layout of that uh, in a bit. But um, so here is the hybrid, you know, which, again, is half in and half out on a weekly basis. Um, what does that look like? Well, like, again, if we go to more modern schools, they don't have classrooms, uh, classical classrooms. They have smaller learning uh, studios that are 500 to 650 uh, square feet because they have a large common space that enables them to move around and, and work in groups and they kind of move back and forth in those pods away from one another. Um, so Jay, we're getting a, a few questions and I'm just wondering in regards to time, because I think you have a, a wealth of information from Jeannie in the um, removal of droplets and a lot of questions around ventilation and the opening of windows. So I'm just throwing that out there as I'm being mindful of our time. I want to make sure we get to that piece and just. Yeah. 
Well, we took that whole technical piece out, remember? I know. But but we can talk about it as we go through yes. this. And, and I can say right now that, you know, in September, we were invited by the Rhode Island um, Department of Education to give a statewide um, presentation on, on our findings because they had read it ahead of time and said, this is what we need and we have to, there was a disconnect between RIDE and the governor's office and the, which was working directly with the Department of Health. Again, no educators there. The educators were telling them this isn't gonna work. We can't open everybody at once. And so um, uh, we basically told them and, and we have all our research we, we made available to them and all the scientific articles that we've been collecting <clears throat> that you need to have you know, one window open, two, two windows in a room. Of course, if your schools don't have operable windows, you have real problems, which means never do that again. But like for instance, Cranston bought air scrubbers that the engineers found for them. Uh, they bought about, um, I think it was, Fifty or seventy thousand dollars worth of air scrubbers for their schools, and what that is is it's a special filter. Uh, I won't go into the technical parts of it that are that have a fan and a filter, and so there's an exhaust, and there's a uh, and then there's an incoming, and so what happens is that the air scrubbers clean clean what's coming in, and exhaust everything out. the The, the exhaust is high in the in the room at, at, a, at an upper window. That may mean plywood in some cases because schools don't have the technology. They don't have the technology across the country except modern schools that follow current ASHRAE standards, which is a standard for ventilation and air changes. Um, our, some of, a lot of our schools have you know, BMS, a building management system. So you can actually exhaust all the air in the school in the early morning hours before class starts and have all fresh air in the school and then through the day you're making a tremendous amount of air changes. In schools without that, you have air scrubbers. So you're pulling the air up. So the aerosol with viral particles, if there's, if it's there, um, is going up and out and you're bringing fresh air in. So you're constantly changing fresh air and stale air. You're not letting it go back out into the corridors because the kids go in the corridors. So you're just washing kids down with virus infected air, uh, which is which is crazy. Um, and so that's how we get away with that. And we have some pictures further on in this that may be easier to understand. Uh, but, um, you know, the in 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 modern schools, and I'm sure a lot of you have designed or seen more modern schools that they're they're built all over the country. Uh, and they and they follow more modern standards where the room itself has an enclosed return duct system to pull the air up and out, in which case you have to use like a MERV 14 filter system in there as you recycle some of the air where the other air is being mixed with fresh air and brought back into the rooms. Uh, so it's really a ventilation problem that needs to be solved. And because what they found is that it's the viral count or the viral load that, that a potential set of students might inhale uh, that you want to break down. If you can diffuse the air and get rid of it and bring fresh air in and have the virus particle count low enough, your, your own immune system can take care of it. And they're even now saying that the intensity of the viral infection in people is, is the reason it's so wildly different from person to person is it depends where you are and how dense the viral particle count was that you inhaled. Uh, it's so easy to sell, solve and deal with, but the, the, all, the, all the information is simply isn't out there. And of course, a mask means that if somebody has is sick and they sneeze, it goes into their mask. And they exhale, it goes into their mask, and what escapes their mask is already a much lower count than it would cause a major infection. And you have a mask, so when it reaches you, it is much lower. And in fact, if you have both those things, both people wearing masks, and you have a lot of diffusion of air and exchanging of air, what you're getting in the end is uh, um, a count so low that no one's getting sick. And in fact, that's what's being proved at schools that at least follow everyone wearing a mask. So, so uh, 
And I think to add to that, the um, schools, I work with teachers um, doing instructional coaching to help prepare them for innovative environments in the rooms that they have those air scrubbers in. It sounds like a large fan. So the acoustical issues have not um, been such that you cannot still conduct class or it takes away right. from um the instruction that's happening, whether it's student-centered instruction, didactic instruction from the teachers. So no, the um, acoustic issues were not such that you could not um, create a student-centered le learning environment. Jay, right. there's also another um, great question. I think that um, by scrubber, you mean a bipolar ionization um, and UV lamps in the ventilation units with MERV 13 uh, filters? Again, that's, a, that's an important distinction. A scrubber would have, uh, well, a scrubber would have a MERV 13 or 14 filter in it. Um, that we've been looking at UV lamps, and there are UV lamps that kind of give you passive air circulation through the space um, because the uh, um, because you have fans pulling air up into the room. So if you have a spiral of air going up to the ceiling these will help kill some of the viral particles. You can't put them in ducts because they need a much slower velocity of air with virus particles moving through it in order to clean them of the virus particles. And most ductwork has air moving through too fast to make a, uh, a UVC uh, light filter system uh, effective. So having them up is a better way to do that. She has large dogs. Um, <laughs> So, um, and then one thing that's really important is that ionization, bipolar ionization, has been proven to be dangerous for kids. Systems that have chemical or ionization filters should be avoided at all costs. Um, air cleaners and filters that you buy at Bad Bath & Beyond are not appropriate for schools. And we do have a technical paper on that, that uh, we can, you know, we'll figure out how to make available to everybody. And that's one of the papers that this Rhode Island um, Department of Education was given and also the, uh, the Association of Building of uh, School Commissioners in Minnesota as well, because we presented before them also. Um, and that's a real misnomer. So, you know, so the air scrubbers are really low velocity fans that are pretty powerful and they have a MERV 13 or 14 filter on them for bringing air in that's cutting down on, on, on different particles and things. The, the most important place is if you can fit a MERV 13 or 14 filter in your induct return air system, that would be pretty handy. Um, like I said, there's a minimum of air systems that are out there that are designed for that. More modern systems, you know, from like the early 2000s on probably are set up for that to be inserted because uh, they already have air filters in there. So it, it's tough because uh, you have to spend a lot of money. Uh, the, all the European schools we work with, they spent the summer with, with the right science, retooling all their school systems by, by beefing them up. But let's face it, a lot of schools don't even have those systems. They have you know through the wall ventilation systems. They don't have modern systems. Um, so I, I hope that we were, and adding humidification is not going to do anything. If anything, I think you, you, don't, you don't want to slog down the air in this case. You probably want to keep it drier. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's another danger point. Um, this picture that Jill put up, do you want to talk about this one, Jill? Sure. So um, in Cranston, Rhode Island, in the buildings that we've designed, we've created learning communities. And so in order to decrease the um, spread of infection or decrease the transmission rate, what we've done is designed learning zones that hold specific cohorts of students. So we're minimizing the interaction. So we've met all of the ventilation requirements. So the next step in this model is really minimizing the interaction. So having a total of 12 students occupy different spaces. So you can see the zones are delineated by color. So those 12 students are given in this particular elementary school, this is a third through fifth grade learning community community that um, they interact with those 12 students throughout the day within a series of spaces rather than just one 
room, we've still honored the kind of work and the kind of practices that need to go on to support student success. So when we think about a holistic approach and the way that we look at a student's day in the life, we want to minimize their contact with others. So we have specific routes to bathrooms. We have specific hand wash, hand washing state uh stations placed strategically throughout. So students are only interacting with those 12 others in their cohort. So if there is an outbreak, it doesn't impact the entire grade level or class. And so we wanted to ensure that through this zoning, if we have to quarantine an entire group, it's only a group of 12 students and hopefully the teacher. And so um, we can then again, minimize the impact on the students and the school. And so in that case, we're really starting to look at what is the day in the life of a student in this kind of holistic experience when we're looking at the variety of strategies. So um, not only are we looking at the environmental factors that must be in place, such as the ventilation, um, the checking of uh, hand washing stations, but also the individual behaviors. So if we're looking at breakfast, those are individual behaviors, attendance, <laughs> what are the things that we can do to set kids up to do things individually? Um, then we're moving into um, advisory programs, really starting to build in those social emotional environments within our schools in, again, these small cohorts, wearing masks, temperature checks, bathroom breaks that are very specific to which bathrooms that we're using. So as we start to build up the types of contact tracing that we're working on, that schools are working on as they've received um, or got students have gotten infected, mm -hmm. we're starting to build those out. So by creating these specific bathrooms and pathways, we're able to start these contact tracing um, processes in schools, in some of our schools that are just happening in the States, where some of those are happening in our um, international schools more at this rate. So then um, there are mask stations, so students have access to masks all the time, but then we've created small group rooms where we can do specific um, assessments. And um, yes, we'll definitely share the tech link for the paper. It's also a live link in the issue document that I'm about to post if you're interested in some of the ventilation um, processes in the technical paper. And then um, within this, we're blending the environmental factors and the individual behaviors, including more outdoor education, how we're addressing lunch, the kinds of furniture that we're using, and the ways in which we're cleaning throughout the day. That also includes students taking um, specific locations throughout the day to minimize the risk and the um, amount of movement, even within a learning studio or what we would call a classroom as well. And so because we know that the wellness of children also depends upon their ability to engage in social activities, connection and movement. And so what we're really focusing on in this book is more about physical distancing and not about social distancing. How do we still create um, physically distance environments, whether they're in traditional schools or schools that look like this, um, that focus on the social and emotional health of our students as well. And I think that leads us nicely into um, the next question, <coughs> excuse me, that Elizabeth has. Um, how do we move from learning community environments where we know that we can truly support the physical distancing aspect in the learning community when we're thinking about returning into a traditional scenario. And Jay, I'm gonna let you move into the traditional scenario because that really hits the recent question is what does this look like in more of a traditional um, school? And then we can talk, Amy, also about the kinds of work that we're doing right now to help teachers and, and administrators manage these different kinds of cohorts. Yeah, so um, one of the things, because you said it looks amazing, and it in fact is amazing, but most schools are still stuck with, uh, you know, 600, 760 to 900 square foot classrooms. Most of them do have connections between them, as you can see the doors down by the window wall. And then, of course, beyond the doors uh, at the top of that drawing, you have a, a corridor. 
and then more classrooms on the other side. And we said, well, how do we create, there's no money to create anything in these, in these older schools. But we started working um, in um, Bronxville a couple of years ago, uh, trying to create training wheels for teachers. And of course, because we have, you know, you know, educators like Jill, they actually can go in. And we said for very little money, we can go in and help retool the space without changing any walls. We said, how do we do that with COVID? And we said, well, the way we do that is we look at taking, and we said, if you took three classrooms, so groups of three, because again, we're gonna look at pods. So if you have three groups uh, of, of uh, uh, three classrooms, we said, set up the room so that the furniture is set up in each room purpose, purpose uh, you know, laid out and designed. So the one on the left is project-based workspace. The one in the middle is commons and the other one is instructional space. Now you can take three fifth grade or three eighth grade classrooms. You can take a, thir a third, fourth and a fifth and have them mix and move around because we have a lot of multi-age groupings that we do. And um, go to the next slide. So this slide was supposed to be animated, but in this, in this uh, um, program, it's not. So you can see there where we have a group of uh, where it says B1 and there should have been, I can't draw in this program either, but there should have been a series of grids so that there are either, you know, one table, one round table that's to the left of the, uh, of the yellow rectangle is four students. So you can put like, I think two of these big muzo tables together, which are right next to the yellow rectangle B1, that could be another grouping and then you can split it. So we said, you know, you can have three, four, five, six groups of students in a pod and they move from one selection to another. And so they can be having direct instruction in this room with one teacher, but with, you know, four pods in, in, the, in, in the room to the extreme right. The one in the middle, which might be a commons, might be a place where students go in there in their own little, you know, groupings and, they're, and they go to their assigned table or their assigned group of pieces of furniture or booths and they work together in teams. And that team might then go to a project-based workspace to work on a presentation. So the, 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 the sort of funny C-shaped table with the circle in the middle, that's a campfire space, or students call it in our schools a fire pit. And on the wall in front of it would be a large interactive screen. So they might be working there. They might be working in the groupings of the four tables that are in the middle of that you know, far left room down by the window wall or up by the corridor wall. So um, that's very simple to do. We also did a study where we took normal tables and chairs. We said, well, this school has nothing. All it has is tables and chairs. And we figured out ways of creating a lot of the things you see here just with a collection of tables and chairs. In Bronxville, we bought new furniture for the room and then we rearranged them uh, because they had at least that much money. And we took three or four of their rooms at the high school uh, back in like 2016 and 2015 and, and started to create like a mini revolution in there to try to get teachers to think differently because the teachers have to be understanding of how impactful laying out furniture uh, is. Um, no lighting changes, no, you know, and of course in these rooms we'd recommend, you know, uh, you know, uh, fan exhaust fans with, with a speed control, one up high and one in low in the room. And uh, again, the technical paper we have shows how that works and, uh, and just get airflow through the room. And I think our engineers found uh, low velocity fans that have a preheat unit for the air coming in. So at least we can pre-temper the air in, in, the, in, in the colder climates to come in at maybe 50 degrees. And then hopefully the air that's being introduced into the room from the normal heating and cooling system um, will will augment that. And maybe a student has to wear a sweater during the pandemic, but that's better than freezing. And it's also much more healthy. And then of course, there's another fan at the far end of the room um, up high that's exhausting the air. So the room fan going in, and input air going in, supply air going into the room at the window is low. The exhaust fan is up high because you want to pull the air up in a spiral away from the students along the ceiling and out. Most of these old schools do not have anything more than a return air plenum in the hallway. And if that's the case, you you know, 
it would be that difficult to, to disrupt the return air system and have them go room by room. It would be a lot safer than trying to draw dirty air out into the hallway where the students have to have to go to get to other parts of the school. Um, I'm seeing how are the traditional, in some cases, elementary school, elementary specials have been integrated into spaces and only certain levels per quarter to minimize interaction. I'm not sure what you're asking there. Um, the question above. I was responding to Amy. Um, oh, oh, if she was assuming that was an elementary space that we have um, been looking at and how were specials yeah. being utilized and integrated. And so um, in the elementary and middle schools, what the um, what some folks have done is they've integrated and created more of an interdisciplinary approach through their specials. In some cases, the specials um, have uh, been reduced to say K through two for music, and it might be for a um, quarter, it might be six weeks, nine weeks, and then they move to another grade level or another cohort of grades to mm -hmm. minimize the um, interaction throughout the day. And so um, those are some of the things that we've done. In the high school, we've done certain things where maybe certain, like the ninth grade students and their electives that are being offered are minimized at that point in time. So you might only have three or four electives to choose from. So we're minimizing the um, impact of certain teachers traveling across all grade levels as much as possible. It's been more of a challenge in the high school because in the elementary schools, even um, we have teachers who can teach more than one content area, but the ways in which certifications work in public schools, I can't have a physics teacher teaching a humanities course. So that's been more of a challenging experience, trying to create a full return scenario where we're isolating certain cohorts within a certain room space for a full day. And um, <clears throat> so that's been a challenge at that level, but we're finding that it's easier in the middle school and the elementary school, and we're finding more interdisciplinary work happening um, at all levels, including the specials. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether Nick can tell us, are we allowed to run over 6.15? Is there something after us or can we let that drag out a little bit? I don't know if you're there to, to tell us, Nick. Well, we'll um, just let it drag out and see who stays. And if there are more questions, keep yeah. coming. Um, well, there's 68 participants right now. I think the question about the big ass fans for new construction um, is interesting. And I think I've heard, we can go up to 20 minutes after Jay is what uh, Nick says. Yeah, okay. Cause I, there's a lot of questions out there. Well, the big ass fans we've done a lot of research on too. And we use them in some of our schools for the, there's been not a lot of construction during the pandemic, obviously it's starting up again now, but the big ass fans do make a fan that has uh, UVC lighting in a compartment at the top of each blade. And since it's a low velocity fan, that would work. The trouble is they're expensive and they can't keep them in production. Everyone's buying them as fast as you can get them. For the future, it's probably a really good thing because don't forget, when this is over, there's still colds and flus and it would actually kill cold and flu viruses, which are coronaviruses as well. Um, and again, the other question to kind of answer, so yes, these three were considered as elementary schools because we started by looking at a school district with 16 elementary schools that are ancient and what do we do? Um, you can look at this as saying, if elementary schools break down their si uh, middle school or high school breaks down their silos, then you know if you think of an old cluster plan, you know one of these could be a math room, one of these can be an English room, one of these can be a history room. Uh, and the teachers can be moving, you know, they can stay in the rooms that students can move around. That's another way to do it. And if, if, if that one room is going to be used just for direct instruction in this case, you know, you, you might go from three rooms to four or five rooms that are part of a, like a, a learning community and make one of the rooms dedicated as a commons area for, for you know, project work and one for um, presentation work. And then the rest of them, you know, can be humanities, which means you're gonna have history or English in it. And, you know, the math room usually has a lot of, uh, of, of extra tools that you might wanna keep in place. Um, but you, you would have arrangements like this in each of those rooms, because the key is 
that the students are grouped unevenly through the space. And that helps mitigate some of the infection rates because if a pod of four or five students stays together for that semester, and one of those kids gets sick, you can test, test the other students, make sure in that one pod, because if everyone's wearing a mask and you got ventilation, it's not going across the room. It's staying with the one kid who may, might have come in with a fever, middle of the day doesn't feel good, that you're already, you're already quarantining five or six students, not the whole school, which mm -hmm. is insane, by the way. There's so many schools that shut down with one kid winds up having you know a COVID infection and you don't need to do that. That's not how it spreads. It's not like the bubonic plague or something. Um, so uh, I think that answers, the goal is to maintain per in-person experiences. So let me see, let me, um, I just wanna quickly move on to, again, you know, in, in, our, in, in the book, we have a lot of these illustrations that just keep slamming home the idea that kids don't like sitting in chairs on a, at tables all day long. Every piece of research, and we've done so many of these schools, and, and so we have, Every school for us is a laboratory. We have over two or 300 schools that we've done. So we have a huge database. And I can tell you right now, no student likes to sit in the same place in the same chair all day long. And within one class period, they might sit in six different venues within a room. And you know what? It keeps them active, it keeps them alert, and they feel like they're in charge of their environment. Um, and this, is, th th this was supposed to be the flexible return model where one or two rooms are set up correctly because the school district doesn't have the money uh, and they don't have the facilities to make the school safe, but they can make two or three rooms safe. So the students that most desperately need to be in school can be in school. And that's what the flexible return model is about. And as you get more money or, you know, you, you, they, they start to get the, the, the techniques and the equipment, then they can keep spreading out room by room and growing the school back into a safer environment. And you know what, you're also getting, um, this is the chance for some schools that don't have access to money to have some money to start to modernize what they need to do. And you know, another ver version of that flexible return model, um, this is the uh, Fisher Steam Middle School in Greenville, South Carolina that we did. And these common spaces outside of all these labs that you see wrapping around the students, um, the tables are far apart and the, uh, and you know, there's a ventilation system that's pretty powerful in the space. So they didn't have to do anything when they reopened. They just brought the students back and kept them spaced and all the systems were already ready to go. Um, and so, uh, one of the, Jill, you might, maybe you want to talk about how important, you know, furniture spatial configuration is because we we have a whole language of what you use in different things to support different learning modalities. Well, as we worked through this process <laughs> and making sure that um, not only are we addressing um, public health concerns and safety, but we're also looking at the creative use of learning modalities that students need to experience to help them acquire knowledge, understanding, and the skill sets needed during their schooling experience. So the types of furniture that we've really focused on are, you know, we need interactive technology areas that are integrated for students to um, work and access the classroom from home if they're in a distance learning experience. We have quite a few schools that are um, experiencing a distance learning, but also it's synchronous with the classes that they're in at the same time. So how do we create technology areas where all the students can function and interact in that way. And so um, devices that are reliable, um, integrated solutions. We have some schools that um, are writing grants for AI integrated solutions, knowing that um, in this kind of environment where we have students at home, we have students who are, some students are ending up quarantined if they have a fever. My own kids have been home since Wednesday. We're waiting for our COVID tests that we took last week to make sure that we don't have it. Um, how do we create 
student agentic experiences utilizing our furniture that not only helps us ensure the physical distance, but also ensures that students are able to work together utilizing these modalities, peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, prototyping experiences. How do we not share materials and how does the furniture support that? How do we create spaces where students and teachers can interact in a physically distant way where storytelling, which is equally as part of a high school experience as it is an elementary experience, um, how do we create those connections that are still comfortable, build trust and relationships and shared experiences? And so what types of furniture can we take out and create pathways and spaces are the types of things that we're doing in our schools. So it doesn't look like those desks with the barriers, I get one spot for the day. But how can we create spaces for students so that they're able to move around and they're able to use things like project-based learning that can create an interactive experience where students are active participants in that learning process. And so, not only that, but seminar and discussion spaces that have integrated access to technology. How are we using, so we use a lot of our conference rooms, a lot of seminar and discussion spaces in our larger spaces, reimagining our library spaces to um, support peer-to-peer -peer meeting spaces to support students still working in the community, even in a virtual way. And one thing that we've really started to look at, not really, but we've been looking at, is how do we level up the use of our outdoor spaces? How do we create outdoor spaces that um, can be recognized as learning spaces and create multiple experiences and all in one, it's a play space, it's a seminar space, it's an open prototyping spaces. What are the sorts of um, materials and things that we need to put in our outdoor spaces to make them functional? And many of our um, buildings that we are facilities directors that we're working with are reimagining the use of furniture that is not in use and in, in their storage buildings and storage facilities. How can we start to utilize those, bring them out into those outdoor spaces and begin to schedule those outdoor spaces throughout the day? So a day in the life, even in the winter, is utilizing outdoor space. And so how do we turn science classes into environmental education classes focused on sustainability? And so um, some of these ideas are taking hold and they're successful because we're looking at this through um, an innovative practice that we want to keep these students engaged, in, connected, socializing through the content that they're required to learn at that year or at that point in time. Um, and so really thinking about our learning modalities in an innovative way, configuring all of those different spaces and using every nook and cranny, that's possible. Working with our fire code, um, our fire, local fire departments and establishing the fire code. I'm not very good at the right words that I'm supposed to say because I'm not the architect on that one. So if I said the wrong word, fire code, fireman, on the teacher side, I put the rug in the hallway and move all the furniture and Jay's like, oh no, fire code sister. Like you can't use that. Good thing we don't use hallways in our new buildings. But so really thinking about what are the innovative ways in which we can start to reimagine spaces, redefining the COVID crisis as an opportunity to reimagine sustainability on multiple levels, equity and access in all spaces, COVID's given us the opportunity to create quality spaces that have the physical affordances that actually use an entire campus. And so I think if we as a group and a or series of organizations think about this as a way to renew the spaces that we already have, we can remove a lot of obstacles that um, COVID seems to have, feel like it's put in front of us when we can turn these into opportunities. So the easiest way to gain this information, if you want to look at the book, which is part one of the larger book that will be a, a print book, probably released sometime in, I'm going to, going to guess January, mm -hmm. VS America also has a publishing arm and they're the ones working with us on this because um, we've been talking about this for a while. Uh, I just put in the chat box with my name at the bottom says uh, 619. If you copy that, 
um, um, website starting with HTTPS and you put that on your browser, you put it on Google and click it, you'll come to the book. And the book, if you haven't used Issue as a platform before, if you just put your cursor over each page, there's a lot of hypertext links. So somewhere about page 12, I think, you're going to see an area talking about, you know, the health and safety of spaces. And, and there will be something in there talking about uh, Creative Environment Corp. That's the engineering firm we work with, at least in this region of the country. And they're the ones that worked on the technical brief. So if you click on that, you will get the entire 17 page technical brief downloaded to you. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of scientific papers in there. They're all hypertext linked to the scientist's name or the research group's name. Because there's articles from, from uh, actually Chris Gill it, we were attracted to in the beginning because he actually did a, a risk management framework. And so back as early as June, he was the one that was saying, if kids are working outside and, and, and they're in small groups, they don't even need a mask. If there's large groups of kids, they need a mask. And he goes through the entire matrix of what is risk, uh, you know, at, what is risk adverse and what is risk safe. And um, if you're a math teacher, like I was, his risk management charts are awesome for teaching algebra just thought i'd throw that out there yeah they are <laughs> so, you know so the sad thing guys is that all the information has been out there since the beginning of the summer let's keep in mind that the cdc uh, you know the time magazine's article that appeared in mid to late august saying this was an aerosol that information was available at the beginning of july Absolutely. You no, know, and then the CDC in the in the middle of September adopted it, and then took it down for a couple of weeks, and then slowly brought it back without a lot of fanfare and embarrassment to them. So they didn't want to say all that stuff that that people were buying and, and the arrangements they were making kids take um, was for naught, and maybe even more dangerous than it was doing what you see at this picture here, where they're grouped around the room. And remember, the, the whole point of a learning community is that with these large commons areas with, with proper ventilation, with a mask, that's all you would need. Now, mm -hmm. someone asked me a question earlier, um, and I'm just looking back at um, that one that said, uh, so that was, um, let me see here, was that air scrubber exhausting through the, yeah. So Brian asked us about if an air scrubber is exhausting out through an existing window, do you need to terminate it at the window or does it have to go out to a duct? And according to our engineers, the exhaust fan is at the top window in the room. So since typical classroom ceilings are 10 to, 10 to 12 feet high, usually at 11, if you can put a uh, window panel out and put that exhaust fan up there, that's all you need. You don't need to put any duct work beyond that. Uh, and of course the intake, you just want to make sure that it's not it's it's a it's at the lower window and it's not facing you know a place where there's exhaust coming out like near a loading dock where a truck might come in that would not be good but usually schools are inboard from from um, um, the street in most cases uh, so that would be okay and it would have a filter on it anyway like probably a Merv 13 filter would do it and these are low velocity fans the the technical brief actually has cuts and makes of models there's also in that technical brief a whole section on you know what to look for to not buy in the way of air purifiers because mm -hmm. some air purifiers have filters in them but the minute you get cold chemicals you get zinc oxides uh and you get other other things that that actually pollute the air that makes it smell fresh but it actually isn't it can actually burn lungs in small group rooms and things like that. So I would read that very carefully and then double check what well-meaning, you know, school committees have, uh, you know, bought for, for the classes. Cause you know, with buying spree over at, uh, um, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond is probably a cause for alarm mm -hmm. because most of those are inappropriate for a classroom, according to our engineers. I didn't know anything about this. So like I said, that, that link I, I supplied at the bottom of, of the of the chat line if you put that on your computer it's free uh, and you can open it back up and you can use it over and over if you want to look at our website uh, we have a section of the website that that's the www fielding 
COVID resiliency. Uh, we have all three scenarios are placed there as well as the free um, issue, which you can also download. Right. And then if you want a free, and if you want you know, a, a cleaner free copy, yes, you can download what we presented today. Or if you write to Sarah at Fielding International, that's intl.com, um, she's our marketing director and she'll know what to send you. You just leave her your, your email, you, you'll get a PDF right back. So, uh, or at least within the day you will. Um, so there, are there any more questions? I mean, we usually can talk for hours on this stuff. I know. <laughs> but, uh, um, and like I said, the, the issue is the first half, which is really dedicated to the strategies and for these kind of questions you're asking and, and, and opening up our doors for the research that we did. Part two is really looking at very much so uh, the fact that, um, you know, the 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 21st the 20th century really started after world war ii uh, after world war one and the spanish flu and it actually it happened right at the same time it's happening now the late you know 2018 uh 2019 2020 it was 20, 19 19 19 19 20. so we're hoping the roaring 20s starts after this you know um because this is a game changer for all of us and mm -hmm. so part two is really what has COVID taught us, you know, because if, if there is an article in Politico, if you go back and you and you kind of dig through it, I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head here in this presentation, but it's about a 40 page article asking every major futurist and thinker in every field you can think of, what do you think is going to change because of this? And it's startling. And, you know, I mean, we've we figured out how, how it's going to change schools. It's going to re it's it really has shown us that the traditional model we continue to build with, with hallways and classrooms is irrelevant mm -hmm. and dangerous. And, you know, the, everyone has said that with global warming and more um, more communication between everyone on Earth. And believe me, I mean, in our field, we've we've been, you know, I I must have been through. 35 countries, uh, you know, in, in just the last few years, we travel constantly and all of our, um, you know, we go to these international conferences, everyone's coming from everywhere. In fact, I caught COVID last January with last February with my wife at an international conference in New York city. We didn't know we had COVID until we were over it and it was May. We got tested and had antibodies, but it happened. Look how fast it happened. It happened like lightning, um, you know, from, from uh, the, the first major cases actually were in Russia, uh, out of China, in um, as early as, uh, I think it was late October, early November. So it didn't start in January. It started much earlier, but it was here and there. And it built up steam over time. Um, so between February, when they first announced that there was something wrong in China, in China and March 15th, think how fast that was that it spread around the world. This is the one event that has unified every single school on earth. Mm -hmm. Every single school on earth shut in the first to third week of March. Every international school we know, all of our friends all over the world, all experiencing exactly the same thing almost at the same moment. And that is what COVID has taught us is that we are one world and we have to look at what the rest of the world is doing. The United States is so far out of pace with what's happening in the rest of the world. It's it's just mind blowing. Um, everyone's been rebuilding schools for the last 10 years. We have not. You know, we've been advocating that there would be a national program to fund mass reconstruction of all of our schools into a new model and out of this out of date model. Um, we got to stop spending sixty million dollars on building a middle school that's appropriate for nineteen fifty. Um, you know, so we're hoping this is that this is a moment of change, and it's a wake up call. Um, let me see. Let's see. Did you do that on purpose? Did you say wake up call and have your phone ring? No, just like that? that was pretty funny. Right, you know, it says, "Curious, what changes you see for restrooms?" Mm. I know Meredith is still there, 6.30, at 6.31. So if you're still there, Meredith, the answer is, at our schools, we started to follow um, 
a model we saw at Kunzkopf Skolan uh, in, in Stockholm back in 2016, and we were thinking about it for a while. We worked in, in, um, in Boulder, and there was a big push at Boulder Valley Schools to go to gender uh, neutral bathrooms, which meant instead of a gang bathroom, you have individual bathrooms that are ganged together. So if you go down in, in one area, there's a door, just like you would be in, like in the lounge in the airport and you open it and there's, there's a sink and a commode. And so we did that in this school that's up on the screen here, mm -hmm. uh, Eden Park in Cranston. The kids love it, the teachers love it, the janitors love it because if a kid goes into a room that's nicely set up, they tend not to mess it up. And all of our, every school we're doing now, we're doing individual bathrooms. This summer, we're gonna be taking Cranston West uh, High School and changing the bathrooms on one of the floors in there as, as, as sort of an early project for what's coming down the, on, on the pike at that high school in the next few years. Um, I taught at the Y for 10 years. Every year we had to take child abuse uh, classes and it's very clear that gang bathrooms are the biggest source of child on child abuse. So it's not parents or adults, it's children abusing other children and it usually happens in bathrooms. And so when you separate that out, I can fit the same number of water closets in the same footprint. I can, like if I have 10, if I have a bathroom with, with 10 stalls, I can take that same space and put 10 separate bathrooms in there. So there's no loss of space. Uh, and it's easier to keep clean and health-wise, imagine. I mean, it's probably the biggest germ trap going. And if you can turn it into individual bathrooms, it's easier to maintain. So that's what we do. We do individual bathrooms and, and we first saw it in Sweden and it works great. Every school on earth now, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, the, 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 the gang bathroom is on its way out rapidly at this point. Um, so now we're down to 23. I think we're just about wrapping up. Yep. Um, I hope everyone got the, the link. Um, and, um, and if not, you know, if you contact us, you contact Sarah at Fielding International because you missed it for some reason, she'll give it to you. Um, and um, good luck to everybody because this isn't over yet. Hopefully it's going to wind up, uh, it's going to wound up soon. Um, somewhere there's going to be a vaccine. And hopefully we're going to take good lessons away from this. What about you, Jill? Any final words? Um, thank you for coming. I think that um, it's been an honor for us to be able to share this information for all of us to move forward in in our field and move education forward in this kind of visioning for um, more resilient <laughs> and flexible learning environments is really important for health and wellness and sustaining this kind of success in the future. So we just want to say thank you. We appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Um... I'm just looking. A lot of thank yous. So with that, we'll see you all at the bar and the buffet at the hotel lobby. <laughs> Not minutes. this year. Well, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, guys. All right. Thank all right. you. Is there any is there any protocol, Nick, for signing out? I think it's safe for you to come back on in in uh Jill, I think Jill already left. Oh my gosh! I guess that's yeah. what we do. I'll go. I'll go ahead and end the session from my end here. Okay. I think. I think that's pretty. Sick. We had sixty-eight people, so less three at sixty-five. That's a pretty good group. That's a pretty good room. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'm looking at the uh, at the comments at the end, and it's a lot of thank yous, complex issues. Some people have already gotten into the issue. Um, piece. If you haven't done it, you should you should copy it too and look at it because it's. We're, it's a it's a work we're pretty proud of, um, and uh, it answers a lot of questions. And unfortunately, it, it takes information that was out there and just puts it in one spot. The sad thing is that information has been out there, and all of our officials haven't been using it. You know, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, if if you go to the if you go to that. Uh, link and you open up the book and you go to the hypertext 
links to all the research and you start looking at the dates on it, you just start, you're dumbfounded. Going, this is July, this is June, what the heck? Right, yeah. You know, right. No one's been listening to the scientists. You know, and, and the aerosol engineers that figured this out. And then if you read the history of tuberculosis, you'd say, oh, my God, what the hell are we doing in these classrooms doing this? This is insane. So it's I, I think the C, the problem is that the CDC has no background in education whatsoever. And, you know, most health departments at every state have no background and they refuse to listen to all their SBA school building authorities in all the various states because they know what the difference is. Uh, and so it's been, it's been a horrifying experience trying to, to scream and get people to stop doing what they're doing. We're lucky, our, our, our mark of sanity is that, you know, we, we did a, uh, you know, an 800 page master plan for Cranston Public Schools in Rhode Island in 2018, which led to a lot of work in Cranston trying to create uh, solutions to all their problems. And they've been our, 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 our laboratory um, and they just passed last night a $147 million bond for new buildings, rehab of buildings. We have over uh, 19 projects wow. to go forward. And the state is now using Cranston as their new model based on, on this thing you see in front of you. There's only a 10,000 square foot pathfinder, a third, fourth, and fifth grade uh, cohort uh, learning community. Um, and, and research in there has been astounding. So kids in, the year before in normal classrooms, you know, they have a lot of resource calls coming in and a lot of supports needed. At the beginning of the school year, 2019-2020, because that's when it opened, by November of that year, we were it was reported to us from the resource teacher in charge of this that the kids she had last year needed no support this year. And that's that's saying a lot because they're able to adapt to the environment instead of uh, um, I mean, the environment adapted to them instead of them adapting to the environment, which is impossible. So they were able to move furniture around. They, every one of these spaces, like the one you see in front of you, has a it's called a zero point setup. So at the end of the day, the teachers have a photograph of how the room is set up to start every day. So they move all the furniture back into a certain position and the students are welcome to move and change things around as they need it during the day. And, and so there's no more desks and lines and the classrooms are here. And it's uh, we're, we're, we're going to have a, we're going to have a filmmaker work on this space once we're allowed to get back in and, and, and actually document what's going on in the space. But it's it's the project that's now firing up the school uh, department in the city to make massive change to uh, their entire school, uh, you know, um, school system. So all the new elementary schools we're going to build are built on this model. And, and we've been doing this for years. It's just it's hard to get that accepted in the United States. We've done three elementary schools for Boulder Valley schools that have been were very well received as well. Um, but, you know, it's hard to build. You have to have public support. There's no government funding or initiatives. So the, the, the path of reconstruction is very, very slow. It's almost glacial. Um, and that's the tragedy of the United States. I don't know where we stand today for, uh, you know, the election, but I'm hoping that we can get a real, um, you know, uh, energy, uh, education secretary back in that, uh, that, that's, that's aimed at doing things and making big change. So, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to sign off too. Uh, so what happens to what uh, the, this presentation that's in the, uh, the, the, uh, the file now, is that something that people can still access or you can access or? Yeah. So the, yeah, so we recorded the session. It'll be available for 30 days after today. Okay. If you can send me the link of how people reach it, can anybody reach it or just the people that registered for no, the it'll, it'll just be a registrant of the conference. Okay. Will we be able to get a copy of it? Or at least the, the link for it? Yeah, the link, it'll be on the website under your session name. Oh, great. Okay. Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. For hosting us. And uh, we had a good time. And I think we had a really good, incredible feedback. So.
Yeah, it certainly looks like it in the chat. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, well, take care, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. I guess I just X out and I'm done, right? All righty. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.